everybody to the Montessori show. This is a monthly uh, live Q&A for all your questions uh, Montessori related. And uh, it is co-hosted by Simone Davy from Amsterdam from the Montessori Notebook and myself, Jeanne-Marie Penel from Voila Montessori, uh, live here from San Diego in the U.S. And today, I am. Uh, we've decided to um, invite a guest and uh, have our own questions. And I hope that we will get uh, questions from our viewers as well. And today, I am honored to have uh, my friend Junafa, who is actually uh, calling in from Nigeria. Junafa, um, welcome. Uh, you have we've been connected through the Montessori community for many years, and uh, I know that you are in the process of finishing up your um, one of your uh, primary summers. And then, what uh, to me is fascinating is that you just finished uh, a rye certification and um, I would really like to know more about first of all how you came to Montessori how you apply it and then uh, we'll get into why you did the RISE certification and what's that all about uh, thank you I'm so glad to be here I'm so honored uh, do you hear me yes yes I hear you fine yes okay um, my journey to Montessori was quite it was it was just by chance my mom owns a school in Nigeria and she used to visit me in the US frequently and um, one of the things that she liked to do when she visit when she visited was to go to different schools and just um, get ideas that she could apply to her own school well one of the times that she came to visit one of the schools that happened to be around me that we went to visit was a Montessori school um, I had actually made arrangements for a co-worker to take her but um, when the co-worker called to make an appointment they said it was the last day of the summer and unless they could get there within the next 30 minutes they wouldn't be able to observe and my co-worker was not available and I wasn't available but while we were speaking uh, while she was telling me this new um, development I see Simone has joined us yes yes I was gonna say wait a second we have Simone on yay Okay, so three continents have been uh, united thanks to technology uh, the, and the Montessori community is really global. So, hi Simone, you want to say hi to... Yeah, I'd love to say hi to Jennifer. Hi, Jean-Marie. I'm Simone Davis, for those of you who don't know us. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I've just sent a link to everyone, so hopefully they'll find us over here on the new call. And um, in the meantime, I have had a few questions come in too. So when you girls have introduced yourselves, um, I can give you some questions too. Perfect, perfect. Jennifer was sharing with us uh, her Montessori oh. journey. So let's finish into all the questions of viewers. Oh, yes. So um, while my friend was telling Jennifer, me... you want to you want to finish us a little bit about uh, yes. your personal journey? Yes, yeah, so just as my friend was telling me that um, someone had to go right away or not be able to go, um, the meeting that I had scheduled was canceled. So it was just like chance, like I had, I was supposed to be there. So I took my mom and I observed there was a one-way window where we could watch um, the children and see the environment. And I had just never seen anything like that before. Um, more than the children and the environment, the owner of the school, she gave us a tour afterwards. And she was so graceful. She answered all our questions. She was patient. She was just really, she was really lovely. And um she made an impression on me and um, I was there with my mom and my dad and my little sister and I, and I like to feel like at that moment where my life changed most of the people who are very important to me were there they were present so anyways I went home and I googled all the Montessori that I could ordered all the books that I could from my library and um, they, there was a local introduction to Montessori course which I signed up for and that just made me want to know more and that's actually when I connected with you and Pilar of Full Montessori and that's right both, I remember um, that. Gave me yeah. some feedback and you know suggested the AMI course and I tried to decide which way to go and since I was just starting my family it made sense for me to start with the zero to three training and then the three to six because I do 
I do hope to take all the trainings. I would like to understand the entire, um, uh, the entire, the first, second, and third plane of uh, the the first to fourth planes of um, human development. So I do plan to take all the trainings, but I'm just going with my children. So with I took the zero to three training. I actually. Um, had my first son one week after graduation. I was very pregnant while I was completing that one. And I started the three to six training five weeks after having my second child. So it's really been <laughs> it's really been a journey. But the, the what's good about it is that I've been able to apply and test out and just um, test out everything that I've learned immediately while it's still fresh. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that I was uh, at the um, Montessori Congress right after, right um, when I was finishing my training, and there were all these Montessorians of different ages, and all of them said to me, "Oh, you're so lucky to have um, this information now that you're right before you have your your first child." And so, because so many of them said that to me, it felt like you know I had been given this blessing, this chance, and I really had to take advantage of it. So I've, I've Tried to do that and shared my try to share my journey um, on my blog ndoma.com and then also through my e-course that I just started and just with um, consulting for families and I I've really mm -hmm. enjoyed the journey so far. Yeah, and and I and I remember I mean I remember our calls and I remember um, meeting you in Portland at the International Congress and. And I know for me personally, I discovered Montessori after I had had children, and I would tend to agree with all the Montessorians that you met that, um, you know, it's so wonderful to have that information before we right. greet our children into this world. And, and that, I will admit, is one of my personal regret is not having known more before having my own. And it's true that it's it's led me to do the work that I do today is to really share this information with everybody. Wonderful, wonderful. Simone, do you want to um, tell us a little bit what our viewers are wanting to know? Um, oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Simone. Can oh, you hear me there. now? Yes, yeah. yes, there you go. <laughs> There's nothing like technical troubles today. I know. <laughs> Luckily, lots of people made it across to the new call. I can see lots of people live oh, over good, here. Good, so, good. hello, everyone. We've definitely got Michelle and Ashley and Sebeya made it over here. Perfect. And um, we're also, thank you to everyone who joined the other call. We had um, the Bucky from Slovenia and Hannah from UK, Bernard from Pennsylvania. Hello. Lisa Hello, from the UK, um, Claudia from Romania with a 13-month-old baby, Sylvie from Luxembourg, Catherine from Panama City, Stephanie, hello again from The Hague, and um, I think, and Imram from Pakistan. I so, Oh, and there's also another Romanian, Rara Serban. So thanks, everyone, and I hope you all made it over to the new call. Um, we're focusing today on babies, and um, we're going to get to toddlers and preschoolers in, in the coming weeks. Um, but the question that came in already about babies was, I've done a lot of research trying to find out Montessori activities for babies, but there doesn't seem to be much out there. We've been doing the mobiles. She loves her butterflies. Do you have any other suggestions for baby activities? She's not sitting up yet. Thanks. From Shannon. Okay. So, Junifa, do you, Junifa, you want to answer um, those questions? Sure. Um, I'm not sure how old, Sh did Shannon say how old her baby was or how baby is? Uh, yeah. She said that she's not sitting up yet, so okay. let's say so, okay. five. Okay. Well, in the first few months, um, the, a lot of the work, a lot of the activities that the child does is actually with their body, like discovering their body, discovering the new environment. and um, while they need the mobiles and the rattles because their hands are developing and they're um, maybe moving a little bit slithering even before they're sitting up they're usually slithering so um, things like rattles maybe um, little balls placed not too close but not too far away that attract them to come um, to move are some of the things that I would recommend but also just giving the child um, a chance to observe, to move their bodies, freedom, 
a space where they can turn around, they can look around. It's usually an, uh, enough, especially with the right training. One of the things that I got from the right training is that children, they and also from the Montessori training, babies want to develop themselves. They have everything that they need to develop themselves. We can help them, but they do have the environment is stimulating enough for them. So um, what, what we, when we think they're not doing anything or we think they're bored, they're usually doing everything that they need to do. So observe and see. I think when you observe and look with new eyes to see, you'll notice that they're actually doing things. It might be that they're playing with the, um, the fiber of their rug if you have a space for them, or um, n noticing new things in the environment, like noticing that there is a couch close by and trying to reach for it. Um, so most times, if you have a small, in a small area in your living space set up for them, with just a few materials, the mobiles, a few rattles, a few balls, you probably have everything that you need. Oh, another thing that they usually like, but they like this more when they're um, sitting up, but you can start when they're lying down. It's, uh, just materials that you have around the house with different textures. So a, a metal spoon or a wooden spoon or a brush, things that have different textures that they can feel, they can touch, they can get different sensorial feedback. Those are things that they enjoy. One material that they had in the right training, which I had never seen anywhere, but which the children seemed to really enjoy, was a, a handkerchief. So it's really light. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. but the child can do so much with it. They can put it over their face, and they can move it, and they can squeeze it and throw it. And so that's something, again, I observed the child using that. I had never thought to offer that to a child, but they, they, they seem to really like it. So those are some of the things that I would recommend yeah. that. And I would also add and encourage um, communication, just talking to your child, letting them know what what you're seeing, what they're doing, uh, you know, singing and that. I think parents get a little bit hung up about uh, just talking to their child um, because they're not responding and, and language isn't coming out of them, but they're absorbing it all. So even at the youngest age, I really encouraged to use proper language and and you know not interrupt the concentration you know especially like when you're talking about the handkerchief is if the child is exploring the handkerchief to let them explore it but when you see through observation that they're kind of out of that you know intense figuring out what this is you can say oh that's a handkerchief or you know just let them know what they're experiencing uh, through language so so wonderful uh, Junifa you mentioned rye so um, I don't know if you know everybody knows what rye is but rye stands for resource for infant educators and I would love for you to kind of share uh, what brought you to that training and, and kind of what you got out of it and um, what might be different and similar to Montessori, especially for the, the infants that, that first year of life? Sure. Um, I took, I, I've, I've known about the right training since the time that I was doing my Montessori um, training too, and I was interested in it. Um, I used to read several blogs, the uh, Janet Lansbury blog, and, um, found in the background. Okay. and um, it just sounded really interesting. I, it sounded like it could be very compatible with Montessori, and some of the, the things that I um, didn't feel like I got enough of from my Montessori training. They were talked about. Um, I wanted to know even more about discipline, you know, dealing with difficult behavior. Um, we talked about respect for the child, but I just um, wanted to know more. And it seemed like the right training would offer that. And so I took the um, right training earlier this year, and it was everything that I expected it to be. There, there are definitely differences, but I think they are very compatible. They, def they balance each other out. I will take Montessori and add Rye. I think the perfect situation, especially with uh, Mon applying Montessori at home, is actually a combination of Montessori and Rye. So Montessori pays a big, uh, plays a big emphasis on the environment, on observation, right. and the ways that the adult can support the child in his development. It's still the child's development, but the adult is 
usually like the shelter, like preparing the environment and all of that. Um, there is also an emphasis on, on respect, but um, the other areas hold um, as much, if not more, emphasis in Montessori. With the Rye, I found I thought I found that there was a very strong emphasis on respect. I mean, it was it it was it's everything. It's the beginning and the end of Rye is the respect for the child and his natural development. Um, there was not as much emphasis, in my opinion, on the environment. I would have liked to see more emphasis on the environment and preparing the environment. Um, so this is where, if you have that information from Montessori. And then you have the respect from Rai and you put them together, I think it would be the ideal situation. Um, some of the differences were things like um, weaning, for example. They, they didn't have the weaning chair at the, as early as we had it. So the child, you would usually feed them till over one year, when they're over one. While in Montessori, we look at the child for signs that they're ready or they're interested in solids, you know, we, we take those signs like them, um, you know, when they start having teeth, they're sitting up, um, they're, they are producing tiling, and all of those, and they're interested in food, so you see them reaching for food. So those are the things that we look at in Montessori. Right. Um, and then we offer the weaning chair, and in, we, you feed the child, but the child is more involved in the process. You're now sitting across from the child, and you know you're giving them the, the message that they are, they are now you know, they, they're they're their own person. They're transitioning from where they're relying completely on the mother for food to where they're able to eat the food of the environment. So this is the Montessori stand. The rice stand was more you continue to feed the child, holding them. Um, you know I don't think that it's you know I don't think it's wrong per se, but I really felt I. With both of my children, I went the Montessori route, and it worked for me. Um, I, I, I can see where some of the issues that we deal with, like so, a lot of people who have tried the weaning table will will say that, oh, the child is always standing up from the chair. It's expected, you know, because they're at that stage where they're usually trying to pull up and all of those things. So I guess if you held them in your hands the right, right way, then you wouldn't have to deal with that. It's a give right. and take thing. I think it's right. a combination. It's knowing, um, I think now that I have both trainings, I would I would still um, go the Montessori way with the winning table and the winning chair. One difference that I might do is to use the stool that is used the right, in the right. So they don't use a chair with a back. They use oh. a stool, and the stool allows the child to sit up with the correct posture, you know, oh. and that way you're not putting the child on there too early, because if the child is not able to sit on the stool, then maybe they're not ready to be sitting, you know? So, yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I liked that they were using a stool, and I did notice that the children they, in the right um, environment, they did have very good posture. They were sitting up straight. They were not like leaning forward or leaning backwards. They were really straight. So I liked that. Um, and I, I, they, I also like that when the child um, is standing up from the table or seems to be distracted, you can talk to them about it. And maybe, maybe they want you to hold them. And it's OK to hold them. So I think it's that flexibility of you know, um, looking at the emotional side, looking at the child's readiness and all of that. So those are some. Of, that's one difference. Um, the another difference is is mobiles. Again, the feeling is that the child has so much their hands, their body. They're learning from their body. Um, a material. Uh, you can put materials around them, but they didn't feel like the child needed the mirror or the mobile early. They wanted the first thing that the child discovers and interacts with to be his hands. So, okay. Um, okay. Again, it it's um I don't think it's I don't think that goes against Montessori because you're not putting things in the child's hand. You have the mobiles there, and usually, in the the child is moving his hands involuntarily, and then eventually he bats the mobile and he notices, oh wait, I'm doing this right. and it's giving right. me feedback, you know. So um, I think at the core. They both have the idea of following the child's development, and um, 
I would, I, I think for me, the biggest thing that I took out of the rye is the respect for the child, especially during caregiving. Um, the way that I diaper my, my, my younger son changed completely after that training. Um, before, before the right training, I used to talk to my children and tell them, oh, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to lift you up right now. But I didn't wait for a feedback from them. I was just notifying them. It wasn't a conversation. You know, I would say, I'm going to put a diaper on you now, and then I'll just start the process. But with the right training, I know now that even the youngest child can give you some kind of feedback. You sure, know, in the beginning, sure. it might just be like they turn their head towards you or they blink their eyes or, you know, they do something, but you pause, you wait. It's called a tarry time. You wait a little bit for them to give you some kind of feedback before you continue. And this makes it a conversation instead of a one-way just notification. Right, know? right. And oh, learning. that's fascinating. Yeah, great. I, I really love that because... Yeah. Um, they're learning that they can say no, because if they don't give you that feedback, then you have to wait. You can come back later to try again. Um, and I think that's such an important thing to learn from such a young age. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Simone, I, I know we can't hear you. You're muted, Simone. I've been muting myself because I've been typing, and otherwise all you can hear is my tapping finger. Oh. So I have to keep reminding oh, I, I try. I know you have some thing. questions, questions that have come in. Do you want to? do, and I think it's actually a really good time to put Sylvie's forward because um, we were talking about speaking to the baby, and she said that she read that um, Montessori says that this is very important to. Sorry, it's hard to read across my screen. Maybe make it a bit bigger. Um, I read that Montessori says that this is very important to talk to babies before eight months and that ha they have a great impact on language skills after. Is this correct and why? And uh, I think it's never too early to start speaking to your child, even in utero. So I think that Montessori, Rye, whichever approach you take, I think uh, language and, you know, this, like when Jean-Marie talked about talking about the activities, but it's also just talking in daily life with a rich language and explain. Right. And um, yeah, the conversations you can even have with a, a little baby of two weeks old when they stick out their tongue and you stick out your tongue back and you're again waiting for reactions and having a conversation. They realize, oh, we're having a conversation right now. Right, and, um, right. Yeah, I like also what Jennifer says about waiting for the reactions. And I think that yeah, isn't specifically not Montessori or Montessori, but I, I love that um, adding that right. layer onto yeah, how and, interact and, with the baby. Yeah, and to that point, Sylvie, I mean, to answer that question, at least from my point of view, it's neither Montessori or Rye, it's just brain development. I mean, this is the child's brain, the first six years is absorbing everything, and they are absorbing what it is to have human interaction. So when you talk about sticking out the tongue and, and repeating that, that's human interaction. That's about this this basic human need that we have to communicate and and so you know giving them language in utero and and those first days they're, they're absorbing everything so you know to give proper language um, from the beginning though I would you know be careful not to over talk and, and Simone and I have, have you know had this conversation about when we do activities uh, with children and this is very much you know in the line of Montessori is that we really choose very few words because we don't want to overstimulate them when we're actually showing something. So um, important to give language but also important to know when to back off and not over talk. So so yeah, any anything that came from Rye and language development, Junifa, you want to share with us? Yes, I think the um, there is definitely agreement in that talking to the child from the very beginning. And I think that one thing that from the right side that agrees with what you said said is um, we limit the words when the child is working, when you're showing yeah. them an activity. But good times for us to really talk to the child and connect with the child is during caregiving. And think about it. The child from birth pees, poops many, many, many times. So you're changing diapers so many times. So those are such, such good times to connect with the child, talk to them about what's going on. Um, um, 
giving the right facial expressions, giving the right uh, attitude, to, and just welcoming them to the process, letting them know that what they say matters and that you want to talk to them. When you're feeding them, when you're holding them, those are times that you can really connect with the child. Um, one of the things that I really um, observed with my own children, and this is not research, but with two children, I really think it has something to do with that. From the beginning, I talked to both of my children a lot and listened to them. I tried to listen to them, to their communication. And I noticed that both of them never really cried a lot. When they needed something, they communicated in a way. Remember that communication is not only verbal, like, you know, they might make a sound or, and I will say, oh, do you need to drink water or do you need to uh, get your diaper wet or, and I think that gave them the, I think, I'm not sure, you know, you could never be sure, but I think that gave them the message that they could let me know without having to cry when they needed something. And from very early on, they found ways to communicate with me. Another thing that I noticed, which I was actually just sharing with someone, um, is that talking to them from the beginning allowed me to understand them very early on, even before most people could, like, very early. And so... I was their interpreter. So when they would say something to someone else or want something from somewhere else and they don't have anybody who understands them, they have this one person who they can trust, you know, to understand them. So I really highly recommend it's such a way to connect. It's what we do every day as human. And they're human from the moment that they're born. So exactly. I think um, when we have that mindset and consider that, then we should talk to them from the very beginning. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One lovely, the, lovely. One of the listeners has also said that Nurture Shock by Poe Bronson talks beautifully oh, yes. about talking to your baby. So that's yes. a good one to yeah. up everyone. Yeah. Um, anything that you want to add, Simone, since you, you work also, I'm not with infants, but, but with a very young age group. Anything that... I think that mostly I think we all agree with the languages that it's never too young. The other important thing is to talk about babies learning different languages um, and they actually hearing the sounds of those languages. So up until eight months they can take in the sounds of any language and if they don't have Japanese in their environment then after that eight months old they'll start to lose those sounds. They won't be making those in the babbling noises that they make. So it really goes to show that the younger the better getting lots of, if you doing bilingualism or multilingualism is to have that exposure to different languages as well. Right, right. And one thing to add also to language and to, to go back to Sylvie's question about, you know, why it's important is that we have to remember that language, that children are born with the potential to learn language. But if they do not hear language and if there is no interaction, language will not develop. So we are, you know, that's why it's such an important role for us to really give them quality language and, and you know, that, that that's one of the key, you know, there's many keys to developing good language, but one of them is a rich language environment. So uh, wanted to make that point. I was just going to add that I think the reason for that time, the eight months, I think it's six, around six to nine months actually, when they're born, they're able to make all the sounds from every language. They right, have all the right. And I think around six months, I think, they start to drop the ones that they haven't heard being used in their environment. Right. So the only way for them to um, retain the phonemes that they'll be using in their language is for them to have heard this, her, um, heard it in the environment. So this is... Um, Again, not just Montessori, it's neuroscience and what exactly. is it, what is exactly. So it is important. And, yeah, and, and and around that same time, deaf children will stop babbling because they're not they're not having that interaction. So yeah, language is fascinating. We could do a whole show just on language. It's yeah. just fascinating. <laughs> anything well, else someone on. that's come in? Yeah. Anything uh, else yeah. that's come in, someone? We have had um, Lisa Hay found it very useful about the great tip about changing because she's got her third baby on the way. And uh, <laughs> Imra uh, is wrote, I found babies playing with a simple piece of cloth. What's the Montessori view? And we were talking earlier about handkerchiefs, but maybe you guys want to take that question up again. 
So, I mean, to me, that's just, you know, I'll let Junifa talk a little bit more, but that's just, to me, the, the notion of children are just wanting to touch everything. And then, you know, it's, it's about giving them sensorial experiences. And that's why, you know, for me, I always kind of reiterate of giving natural made toys where there are different uh, textures and, and such so you know cloth textile is, is another sensation is another sensorial experience uh, maybe Junifa you want to tell us a bit more about why rye uh, tends to use that a lot in there and I've always noticed like they they set them up in this kind of cone shape yeah uh -huh. yes um, the reason is that it's Again, something that the child can use very, from the very beginning. It's very light. So once they discover their hands, even before their hands become really efficient, it's something that they can um, pick up without having proper grasp. They can just grab it. Um, and if it falls over their face, it's not something that would put them oh. in danger. You know, it's almost like pick a uh -huh. like you know, it covers your face, and they're like, and then they pull it up, and then it's like, oh, I did it, you know? So it's something that a very young child can enjoy, can be used in so many different ways. Um, one of the things that Magda Gerber, who's the um, founder of Rye, says is that she wants to give the child materials or activities or play objects that are, um, that are not active. She wants them to come alive in the child's hand. So a piece of cloth, is, it doesn't do anything. It just sits down there or it just sits but when the child picks it up, it can be a scarf, it can be a peak, it can be whatever he wants it to be. It can be a cape. So it's something that they can use in so many different ways. It's something that it's a, it's a very good example of an open-ended toy, you know, that the child can right. do anything and do anything with. So um, that's, I think that's, yeah. what, that's why it's recommended. So, Simone, I have some specific... You can just wash it and... Right, it's right. It's easy to clean. It's not toxic to put in their mouth. Yeah. Right. Uh, Simone, I have some specific questions for Junifa, but I'd love to know if there are some more of our viewers' questions that need to be answered. We can't hear you, Simone. Again, <laughs> I won't, whenever I'm on the other page, I'm muted. Okay, so to come back, uh, Catherine said that it, she thinks it's important to talk exactly to the child, that he sees you and not to be the voice on the back that's constantly talking and this way they won't be able to pay attention to you talking. And very I think good point, very good that point. That is a yes. good point to note, thank yeah. you. Catherine, is yeah. that eye contact is very important and getting yes. down to the level and getting their attention when you're speaking. Um, actually just background noise, just keeping that to a minimum so that they can focus. And then Claudia has a great question, her little one's 13 months old. It says, what are the sensitive periods around this age and what should we do best to help and support her in the coming period? Ah, 13 months is fun. 13 months, Junifa. You want to talk to that? Sensitive yeah. periods around this age? Yes. Um, movement. The child wants to move. They want to explore. It's um, what they want to do. Uh, and movement is different things. So they want to move big movements, large movements, their whole body, and also um, small movements with their hands. But I think around 13 months old, you will find that they're very interested in large movements. My second son is actually 13 months old now, so I know that he is right there in the middle of um, the sensitive period for movement. And how can we support the sensitive period for movement? We can give them a safe environment to where they can move, where they can explore. Um, mm -hmm. We can provide um, we can provide materials that help them use their body in different ways. So, like my son really likes the slides that we have, or um, things that they can hang from. And at 13 months old, you would be surprised if you give them the opportunity; they're able to do that. Things to climb, so they can climb stairs. Uh, you will find that they like to climb. If you don't give them proper things to climb, you'll see your child will be climbing a table or a couch or they just want to climb because now they're walking and they want to use their, their, their bodies in a different way. Um, this is not a sensitive period, but they're also getting into that period where they want to apply maximum effort. So giving them things to carry. I know that my younger son really likes to carry things now. It's also another way that they're moving their bodies. 
And then just things that they can manipulate using a spoon. It doesn't have to be just materials, but allowing them to feed themselves, use a spoon. If they have a bottle, allowing them to open the cap for their bottle. If you want materials, things that they can open and close seem to interest them. So those are ways that they're moving. Um, of course, they're in the sensitive period for um, language too. Um, they're starting to, if you listen, not every child, children are different, but for a lot of children around that time, they're starting to say some of the words that are common in their environment. They might be saying um, wawa or that's wata for wata, ata, you know, like my little son says that now. Um, he says amen, you know, like so just very short words or one syllable, two syllable words, they start to say that. So could rich language in the environment, talking to them, singing to them, reading to them. Um, and not just talking to them actually, but just also having them in the environment when you're talking to other people so that they're seeing how you're interacting with other people, how you carry conversations with other people. Um, I know that Maria Montessori, one of the things that fascinated her when she visited Africa, for example, was that when women went about their business, they carried children on their back. And so the right. child was able to see the mother interacting with different people in the community, hear the language and all of that. So just exposing them to language um, for movement to taking them outside, taking them outside, taking them to a park. There's different um, to, like different slopes, different surfaces, like they can walk on the grass, they can work on sand, they can work on the hard floor, um, hard, uh, granite or on the road. Or, you know, so just giving them those opportunities. And I think um, for me, for both of my children, the most important sensitive period I noticed, I wouldn't, maybe I shouldn't say most important, most important, but the strongest that I observed, movement is very strong, but the need for order seemed to be yes. so high around this period. And it shows itself in different ways. I mean, like sometimes I'm bringing out some food to set up for my children and Metu will just come and take it and go put it back where, it's, where, where, it, where I brought it from. And this is where talking to him also comes in. If I didn't tell him before, I, I have to tell him, oh, Metu, I'm going to prepare your food now, so I'm going to get the bread out of the store. And he understands, so he knows. But if I just bring it and keep it on the table and maybe go to grab a knife or something, by the time I come back, he has put it back where it's supposed to be. <laughs> So, yeah. Um, yeah. creating an environment that is orderly for them so that they know that there is a place for everything and everything uh, is in its place. Um, involving them in the restoring of the environment, no matter how small, like right now what he likes to do after they're done eating, just taking his plate back to the kitchen and putting it in the, in the, um, in the dirty cart that we use. It's for him, restoring the environment. I find right. that um, when when there's when we're in a place where there's disorder, as long as he has a way that he can make an effort towards restoring it, he's happy. When he struggles is when there's nothing that he can do about the disorder that he encounters. And mm -hmm. then just order in their day, like some kind of routine. And um, it's not necessarily possible to have the same routine or the same order every day. But one thing that you could do is to have some signals or some markers that let the child know, oh, it's coming time to eat or it's coming time to sleep. It could be a song. It could be something that you say. Um, but order is so important to them. The way that you do things, even the way that you put your, their clothes on for them. So again, as part of language and all of that, you, when you're putting the clothes on from early on, you could have them participate. Like, could you put your leg in? So even when you're in a hurry, when you're in a hurry, you might be tempted to just like do it fast and just put it on right, them. Right, right. And then at this age is where you'll see the child, that's to make the child cry or get really upset. And it's just that need for order that, that they're reacting to. So I think these right. three are the strongest ones. Um, uh, as the sensitive period for small objects too is starting around the right, period. Right. They're mm -hmm. noticing very little things in the environment. Like when they're walking on the road and they notice that one thing that you didn't notice. Like there, there are little things. Uh, I cannot think. But well, maybe on a painting, for example, they notice this tiny detail. Or maybe there is one little speck of dust on the floor, and that's what they notice. Um, Again, I'm noticing this in my younger son right now. And 
two things that you could do to help that. One is to be conscious that they need a safe environment. If there's a pin on the floor, they're going to find it and it's going to go into right. their mouth. So you have right. to be careful right. what you are um, allowing. And then just giving them time to stop and observe and take notice of these small things. And, um, you know, if they need time, the other day we were in the park and Matthew noticed this very small seed and he he bent down in this squatting state where he squats like he wants to sit and he watched it. And it's like just giving them, and it's not always possible, but as much as you can, giving them that time to notice these small things. Because these are the things that um, give them love and appreciation for the environment and in future inspire them to care for the environment. So I think those are the four. Yes, yes, definitely. Some ways that we can support them. Perfect. Yes. No. And and I think you've touched on all of them. So I hope that was uh, helpful to I forget who uh, Claudia who asked that question. Uh, Simone, do you have anything else? Because I know we've we've. I mean, I know we started a little late. Coming in still. Um, and okay. we start late. So um, I'll tell you what they're about. There's one about sleeping bags, about the floor bed. But maybe they can look back to past episodes because we did discuss that in the last two shows. Um, about bilingualism or using more than one language in the home around an infant and toddler and nature-based learning. Um, but maybe we can do outdoors so, as a whole separate. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind touching on the outdoors. I know that we did talk a lot about uh, bilingualism in, in another um, show, but um, I know that uh, nature is so important and I was actually at a talk last night uh, by uh, Dr. Tina Payne. She wrote uh, with Dr. Siegel, uh, No Drama Discipline and the Whole Brain Can Child. Can I interrupt you for a second, Jean-Marie? Yes. You're very small on the screen. Can you make yourself bigger? I'm very small on the screen. Can right. you click on yourself? I don't know. Yes. Anyway, I'm, I can see myself nice and big, but um, okay, anyway, I, I was okay. I was saying that uh, nature is is just critical for our children, and I was saying that I, I went to listen to Dr. Tina Payne, who wrote No Drama Discipline and the Whole Brain Child with uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, and in her talk she mentioned that there is actually about 10 percent of children who have sensory issues, whether it's sensory sensitivities or just, you know, having having kind of uh, issues around that. And so I asked, why is that and is that something that is on the rise and what can we do about it? And it really is, the answer was simple. It was children need more time in nature and really need unstructured play outside. And that is how we're going to give them so much more, um, you know, uh, how do you say, stimulus to their senses, that, that we are going to towards this, you know, she was saying I think there was 10 hours less of unstructured outdoor time in our cultures today. So, um, you know, nature, uh, I know that the question was more on, on nature-based education, but, you know, Montessori does prone a lot about the respect of nature and just the, the whole um, ecosystem and, and having children outside. So, yes, I totally encourage um, all of that. Can I, can I just add a little bit about nature? Yes, um, please. So... I have to, I've been meaning to write about this, but I haven't gotten around to it. But my children are about 18 months apart. With my first son, it was so easy to do Montessori at home, like have the shelves and the activities and have um, everything so perfect for him. And then with my second son and having two of them, they seem to be constantly interrupting each other. So as soon as the first one is concentrating on something, oh, the second one is interested in that. And then as soon as the second one is interested in something, the first one is interested in that. And at one point, it was really driving me nuts, and it was getting really hard to just, you know, be the peaceful person that I wanted to be for them. And, you know, I found the solution. We just go outside. <laughs> so 
So I don't try so hard anymore to have them, you know, sit down and take things off the shelf because I found that when we go outside, they actually find opportunities to do all of these things. You know, like I mentioned the example of the sensitive period for the small objects. They're in the sensible, sensitive period for movement. Outdoors, in nature, there's so many ways to move. You can climb a tree, you can jump, you can roll on the grass, you can tumble, you know, sensorial experiences. There's grass, there's sand, there's leaves, there's so many different sense, the barks of trees. Um, there's so much sensorial information. And then there's so much order in nature. You know, there's a place for the leaves. There's a, you don't see, uh, you know, everything has a place if you look. So um, sometimes we spend so much energy trying to set up the shelf work and the things in the trays and all of that. But if we go outside, the children find these opportunities to use their hands in different ways. When you pick up a leaf or if you pick up a little flower and when you pick up a stick or a stone, you're using different grasps, grasps. You're using your hands in different ways. Um, you know, so even you can find inspiration for activities at home, art activities, um, language activities. You can find so much inspiration when you go outside. This year, we have spent most of our time outside. We go out like every day. I just find that when we go outside, we're more peaceful. I'm more peaceful, we're not in a tight space, and then they're gaining so many experiences. And one thing that I, I, I noticed, and I told my friend this, I said to her, you know, Sulu has never said to me before, oh, I did this puzzle yesterday. He has never, like he does puzzles, he does activities, but he never talks about them later. But when we go outside and he sees an animal or a bird or experiences something, he talks about it for such a long time. Those experiences right. stay with him. So I really think that um, we give our children more gifts when we give them experiences in nature, um, more, even more than when we you know, focus so much on the um, activities, the setup fabricated activities. Those are important, but not at the expense of spending time in nature. Definitely, definitely. Um, Simone, I'm, I'm not keeping track of time. I know we started late, but I don't want to keep people too long. I mean, maybe we can answer one or two uh, shorter questions, and then we'll have to do some, some more and, and have people uh, send us questions ahead of time and all that. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I've we have had some more questions, and I've also told people that we usually wrap up around the one hour mark, which is about now. Um, okay. So I'll just pass on some last comments, and maybe we can do a quick, for the people who haven't heard the floor plate and sleeping bag, we'll give them a two minute rundown. But Katka said that she um, loves to hide herself behind a cloth diaper and play peekaboo, and then take a toy and make a movement of a rainbow in front of her. She's quite good at focusing 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Um, which I think is just really nice to hear what people are up to. She likes to put some gloves on her hands, so I suggest you guys, and with bubbles and things as well. So I suggest you guys read in the chat um, some of the things she comes up with. I'm sorry if you are watching on an iPad, sometimes the chat box doesn't come up, so next time watch on a computer. <laughs> um, the other th questions was about sleeping bag and the floor bed. And, um, Basically, with a sleeping bag, we do find that sometimes that can restrict their movement. And if they're trying to move and not getting enough space, then you might want to take it off. I know that you might think differently about that, Jean-Marie. What do you think about sleeping bags? Um, I mean, to me, I've always thought sleeping bags were a good idea just because we don't, you know, want to have blankets and such that could, you know, could be harmful for a child who doesn't yet, you know, be able to take it off their face and, and such, but a loose sleeping bag, I mean, children do figure out how to still move in it, so if it's loose enough, I think that it doesn't restrict movement uh, that much. When, when they are older and they are able to, you know, take blankets off of them and put them back on, then definitely, you know, let go of the sleeping bag and really encourage them to learn to use the blanket properly. Yeah. What about you, Jonifer? Um, I haven't, I, I agree with you. I think a loose sleeping bag that still, that does not restrict the movement is okay. 
Um, I use light, very light blankets, like the Eden and the Maze ones with my children that are not too heavy. And those work for us. Um, I just wanted to say, I wasn't sure what, what the other person was saying about the hands and the box, the rainbow and, and that. But it brought to mind one of the, one, another big takeaway from the RISE um, training was the importance of our hands. Um, and there was such an emphasis on that. And two things that, that stayed with me is that they never put things in the child's hands. Oh, you know, so they, okay. They always put it close to the child so that they can reach for it when they want to. But they find they, like, it was almost like disrespectful to put something in the child's hand. And, you know, I had never thought about it much before then, but I've been really conscious of it. Um, since then, I, I did some of my observations afterwards. And I just noticed how much we tried to help the child with his hands and how it started to look really disrespectful to me, I have to say. So I think when we're conscious about it, I mean, I think there'll be some times when you need to help the child, but I think when you're conscious of being respectful to these this tools, because these are their biggest tools, then you see that you're interfering in less. And you'll find that they're able to man, um, manipulate in their own way and discover. Sometimes we don't have to show them. We, if we watch and see how they interact first before we try to show them, we'll see that they usually discover. And then, so that's from the child's part. And then from the adult's part, even more than your voice and your facial expression, the other thing that really sends the child a message is your hand. The way that you pick up the child, the way that you carry the child, the way you lift his legs up when you're putting the diaper on, the way you turn him around, you know, the way you pull him away when he's trying to hit his brother or his sister, you know. So all of those things are sending messages to the child. So just being conscious of the message that our hands give to the child and making sure that our hands are very gentle, very loving, and they always communicate love and peace to the child. Because sometimes we're like, oh, nobody hits you. Where did you learn violence from? But we already can be violent with our hands, even without knowing. Especially when we're rushing, you know, when we're rushing to dress up the child or rushing to do whatever to the child. Unknowingly, right. we can be very um, violent and rough. So what we need to slow down and just be peaceful and gentle in the way that we, we use our hands with the child. Even when we're giving food to the child, you can bring the food close to the child's mouth or you can, you know, put the spoon in his right, mouth. Right, right. So it's just, um, it was very interesting to see how important your hands are and also how important the child's hands are and how, you know, both of bo the way we treat both hands, our hands and the child's hands, send messages to them, message of respect when we right. do not right. touch his hands or force him to take a material, and messages of love when we're gentle and slow and peaceful in our interactions right. with right. the child. And I think in, in Montessori, I mean, Dr. Montanero talks about that in how we yeah. handle children, handling, you know, yeah. and that's and that holding. whole... That whole, you know, handling and, and holding children, and you know, um, so so lovely. Um, not sure if we should keep on going. I mean, I know there's more questions. Uh, Simone, what are what are? Uh, we started 13 minutes late, so I don't know. I'm, I'm okay. If you're okay. <laughs> hey, that's okay. Good. Sweetie, do it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's, let's run till 9:13 uh, Amsterdam time. Um, okay. We, we have time just to quickly do a review on the floor bed, which we have discussed in past shows. But for those of you who don't know about the Montessori floor bed, the idea is is that instead of putting a baby in a cot, um, that's more convenient for an adult. But actually, for a child, if you place them in a bed from birth on the floor, so that gradually they'll be able to crawl out when they when they wake up, they don't have to call out to you. Um, they'll have freedom of movement and they're also more responsible for their putting themselves to sleep and things like this. Um, but not from birth you maybe have a Moses basket and you put it onto the floor bed so that they get points of reference of where their sleeping place is. And um, I'm speeding through it but <laughs> I think no, we no, have talked about it in yeah. a lot of detail. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything um, yeah, else you want to... I, I found that the floor bed for me um, is actually a very good... Um, tool for large gross motor movement. So with both of my children, that's the first thing that they try to climb, climbing into bed and out of bed. And just moving around in bed, I think um, I found that that was very, I just thought it made a big difference in their in their movement 
and you know even crawling like putting themselves in that crawling position because when you think about when you climb out of a floor bed um, you kind of have to lift your core up a little bit to get over the edge so um, I, I thought that was very very beneficial for them and this is one difference with Montessori and Rye. In Rye they recommend um, cribs until the children are much older because you know it's kind of like a restriction but um, I think that the, the floor bed allows the child to be able to come to you when they need you. I found that my children, they needed me sometimes in the night and they came to find me and you know, I, I met their needs and then they can go back and I, and I, um, I think it's a respectful way, it's a respectful option for the child, it's another form of respect because you're saying, I trust that you know when you want to sleep and I trust that you're able to come out and talk to me if you need to talk to me. And sometimes they do just want to be with you and you know, you deal with that respectfully. And gradually um, they, they, they develop that ability to know that, okay, it's time to sleep, I can go by myself. And this doesn't always happen immediately, um, but in the long run, I think it's a really, um, really yeah. I, I yeah. would recommend the floor bed. Yeah, and the and the whole you know the whole notion between the floor bed is is this you know this notion of freedom of movement, but also uh, for me that fascinating is also the visual sense. I mean the 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 visual sense is being still being developed when the child is born, and you know having just the entire room to be able to to inquire and look around as opposed to being in a very small container with uh, usually bars or padding where you can't really focus near and far so you know there's the freedom of movement there's the visual sense and you know like Junifa says is that whole sense of respect of, of trusting the child that they know where it is um, that they can safely sleep and I have just one anecdote about that the other day I went and um, took care of a friend of mine's 10 month old and she was asleep when I got there and her mom left and she woke up and uh, I went up to the room and she's on a floor bed so she had crawled over by the door so I had to kind of you know open the door slightly and and show my face and I was kind of down on the ground and she saw me and she did not like that, like I would, I wasn't her mother, and she just crawled right back to her bed. She mm -hmm. crawled back to her bed, calmed herself, and then was ready to come and and meet me. So I just, you know, kept my distance and waited until she was ready. And to me, I would have never been able to have that respect for this child had she been in a crib because I would have had to gone and, and pick her up and you know it, it's just a very different interaction and it's this notion of really trusting our children to kn that they know uh, what, is, yeah. what is right for them. So, we, yeah. we don't have a, a lot of time to talk about it but another thing that I really enjoyed in the right course was learning about the child's ability to self-soothe you know um, and just again that tarry time I mean we're, it's I know for myself, I, it's so, um, your first instinct as a mom when your child is crying is you want to stop whatever is hurting them, you don't always give that time for them to um, suit themselves, and it's not, you can be there, you can um, use your voice, they, they call it voice control sometimes, you can say, I see you, you know, do you need me, and especially when you've been communicating with the child from the beginning. Sometimes the child will come to you because they need you. And sometimes they just want you to be there. And gradually, they, don't, they need you less and less. So there, there was a lot of talk about that. And one more thing that I liked about the floor bed is, depending on the size that you choose, yeah, both when you're breastfeeding and when you're older, you can sometimes lay in bed with your child. You can lay down and read a book to your child. It will be kind of hard to fit in a crib. But with the floor bed, you, yeah. you have the opportunity to do that, and I really enjoyed that yeah. with my boys. Yeah, wonderful. Someone wonderful. also had a really good question about tappuccinos. Did you use oh, a tappuccino, okay. Jennifer? Yes, for two of my children. I Not for a long time. I used it for about the first eight weeks, and I have to say I highly, highly, highly recommend it for both children. It was like... Um, 
we, both of my children, from very, we, we, we traveled a lot from when they were young. Um, they, were, they were not born in Nigeria, so we had them and then we had to come back home. And that toponcino was just this thing that you could move them from one, you could put them on a couch or on the bed or on their um, floor bed or wherever, but the environment, the immediate environment, the immediate feel was the same. To pass them around from one person to the other, um, Solu could hold Metu in the toponcino, and it just gave this feeling like your temperature, your you know, think about when you're holding a baby and they're on your hand. Um, it's a different temperature when you put them on the bed, and that's why they just wake up as soon as you put them down. But with right. the toponcino, you know, it's constant. And so I know some people sleep on it before they have the baby, and so they can still smell you, they can feel you. I, I highly recommend it. I do still think that there is need to hold your baby in your hands without the top on chino so that they can feel your body and feel your skin. But um, I really found the top on chino to be helpful. We used to take it outside. We could put it on the grass, and he can get some fresh air. It was just this little thing that, you know, you easily transported the baby around. And um, yeah, I don't know what the yeah. question was, but I highly recommend the top on chino. I yeah. love it, as you yeah. can tell. Yeah, and if anybody uh, it, to actually make their own toppuccino, I do have uh, the instructions on on the website, um, and also I highly recommend it, especially uh, for those who you know do have a lot of visitors and such, because as Junifa said, yes, it's important for the parents to you know have that skin to skin, but. Uh, it's not necessary for everybody else. So the Tompancino is is really a security for other people to hold the baby, especially for younger siblings and such. So definitely um, a great uh, piece of Montessori material. Yeah. Uh, I, um, I just to tell people. Oh. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, maybe some people don't know what a topachino looks like, but it's basically like a quilted pillow, very thin, that um, is about like this big, and you can lay the baby on it. It just takes away some of the sensorial experiences so that they're not overstimulated with guests, and, and as some of the Junifers pointed out, how you can use it. So right, just wanted to right. clear that up. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that I know that the time is almost up, but, and there's so much that you can say about babies. But I, uh, I have a, a, an e-course that's coming up and it's focused on babies from um, birth to 18 months old. And we talk about a lot of these topics in the, on the e-course, the sensitive period, the environment, the tapuccino, the materials that you can use for the baby, um, our role as adults and how we can support the child. Um, and all of these things in more detail than we can cover, obviously, in one hour. So um, I think, Simone, you're going to send out a link when we're done? Yeah, send it through to me, Jennifer, and I'll put it in the email with everyone. Yes, yes, wonderful. And and uh, so Junifa's e-course on infants and Simone just finished up a wonderful uh, e-course too on setting up the Montessori environment that uh, from under, under from what I understand, you will also have a self-paced uh, course starting soon, Simone? Exactly. People can now sign up for a self-study version until we run the next group in September. So they Perfect. Can the Perfect. And then I still do my private one-on-one -on -one, uh, Montessori parenting program, and I think I'm going to have to come up with a group course as well, maybe in the fall or something. Um, but it's been wonderful having everybody uh, on. Again, our apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning of, of uh, connecting three continents, three Montessorians together. Um, it's just been uh, so, so wonderful to have you on the show, Junifa. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions because I had some questions that I really <laughs> wanted to answer, but we'll just have to yeah, maybe yeah. do another Rye, yeah. Rye Montessori show in the yeah. future, so, so definitely. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll be happy to come back to talk about talk more about Rye. There's so much I also wanted to share that I didn't yeah. get a chance, but it was lovely to, um, to hear everyone's questions and comments and just chat with you ladies. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank
And thank you, Simone, for for um, you know taking in all the questions and kind of monitoring that uh, today. And then we will be back with everyone uh, in May, the last Friday of the month. And we have yet to decide what our topic will be, but we will let everyone know. And uh, we hope to see you then. Yeah, the 27th of May. And I think we, we're talking about talking about toddlers. So um, sounds Perfect. good. Perfect. So that will be your, that will be your, um, your field of expertise since you get to hang out with them quite often. So wonderful. People. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. All righty. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.